So my name is uh, Nasir Al Khoury. I'm 38 years old. I'm located in Stockholm, Sweden, and I reached out to you because uh, I see that most working games see that as a, like a privilege and a passion project, but they get a lot of beatings. They're not treated well, and they just stay. And my idea is that you can actually move on. Even if you have like your dream job, uh, you can find something better or at least a job that treats you better. So it's a bit about daring to move on if things don't work, if you don't feel comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to, you know, even if they're not inside games. Although, you know... Uh... I don't have this written down in front of me. I knew this was a thing I was going to ask you at some point. I was not expecting to ask you right up at the top. But, you know, one thing, and I just spoke at a panel like a couple, like a month and a half ago, and I asked people that too, this too, because I, I always feel like, you know, there are a number of reasons why I started doing this and why I continue to do this. And, you know, I mean, you know, I'm sure you know about like Yelp and there's websites that, uh, like uh, Glassdoor that yep. are similar, but they you know, are for people to review companies they worked at or to evaluate their experiences being interviewed and considered. And, exactly. you know, I am always wondering, like, the degree to which, like, it is really bad to be working in games. <laughs> like, yep. like, I'm not asking for you to, uh, you know, to, to, to complain or to necessarily, like... Uh, to disagree with that, but like I, I always am wondering, like, are people telling me, you know, the absolute worst stuff that they have been going through? Are they just telling me stuff that they happen to be going through at the time? Because, you know, it's not like when you're in a relationship with someone, you go around and tell everybody, oh, you know, things are really copacetic, they're totally fine. Like, you tend to only talk about the extremes. And so yeah. I always wonder, like, uh, you know, it, like, why does it seem to perpetually be so rough to work in games? Is it because it's a cool job, or is it not always that that rough? So I, I know you're just one person, think, but what's your sense of that? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think it's important to like treat it as a job. I mean, I, I think that's working in games is the same as working in a, like a car uh, in a car factory or anywhere really. It's a job you're getting paid to work. Uh, so, like, I don't think it's extreme. It's just like, uh, for my case at least, uh, I worked at DICE previously. So when I started, this was DICE. So everything was awesome. Uh, I didn't see anything bad. I wasn't experienced either. So I didn't know what to expect. But it's like, uh, I quit after eight years. And that it wasn't because it was horrible. It's just because after eight years, I was a different person. I had a family. I wanted something else. So I think what's raised in the public is always like the extreme. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's like any job, really. You have good days, you have bad days. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you reach like a crunch stage, every day is a bad day. But at times that disappeared. It wasn't like constantly crunch. It just like, for me, it was like I grew up, uh, and I, I wouldn't like change my any of the choices I had. I learned so much working at the AAA studio. But I was, yeah, I was three eight when I quit. So like, I had a little kid, family, and I just went. It's not for me anymore. I've been became this naggy, annoying guy complain <laughs> about everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, just... and I mean, that, that's the thing. When you work in a game studio, you're always told like you're part of the team, you're important. What, what would you do if you left? But the reality is, if you leave, there'll be 300 CVs trying to replace you since it's games. Too bad about leaving. Yeah. I mean, you if, said... If you get like, my idea. Uh, yeah, I don't want to interrupt. I don't know. Were, were, you, uh, were you about to say more? 
I'm sorry? Oh, I just said I didn't want to interrupt. Were you about to say more? I don't know. I mean, I just wanted to say, like, you know, I really appreciate, you know, what you had written in our, uh, in our emails recently. And, uh, I mean, you said that you wanted to talk about sort of fighting the good fight in an industry not yeah. especially known to want to do that. So yeah. what is the good fight and why do you think games are a little more resistant to it than other industries? Uh, I think we're pretty young and we're still trying to find what works or not. And we're a very capitalistic industry. It's about money. Uh, we make products that sell for $50. And I hate that word because for me, it's a game is not a product. But in AAA, it is. You release, hopefully, annually. Uh, you add, like, these features that must exist in every game, and you try to monetize everything that's around them. So the reason I left was Battlefront 2, uh, where I realized that I was in this machine when we were going, like, let's sell loot boxes. That's like the prime example. And for me, that wasn't strange at all. Uh, I was in the middle of, of development we were removing season pass, so basically giving away content for uh, free, in quotes, because uh, you pay for the game, so it's not actually free. But, and then uh, your leadership team tells you, like, we need the money that we'll lose on the season pass. So how do we do that? Let's introduce these loot boxes. And you go, that makes sense. Let's do it. But in hindsight, that wasn't that consumer-friendly. And I work in games because I love games as a gamer. Mm -hmm. And if someone had sold me a game like that, I would have been upset on the outside. But while I was in it, I didn't see anything weird about that. So at the end, I had to like, ask myself, am I doing good here? And, and I wasn't, I thought. So let's leave them. How often does that come up? I mean, because I know, or at least I've heard, you know, game companies are fairly uh, bifurcated, like their the departments can be little worlds into themselves. Um, yeah. And, you know, you get a certain impression from reading social media, reading websites, reading stuff on the internet. Um, I mean, how much, how often does that sort of question come up in conversation with others, or does it seem like people are asking that themselves, like, uh, yeah, am, I doing, am I doing good? Because I feel like what we often hear, and what we often hear defended, is the, the capitalistic side that you described. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it comes up, uh, I wouldn't say like daily, but it comes up, uh, especially like, uh, it was a weird time at EA, when we had uh, Andrew Wilson being the CEO, and he introduced player first. Everything we do should be player first. Oh, people are getting like maps for free. Yeah, that's good for a player. So then let's go ahead with it. That was my reasoning. We had others in the studio were going, this is bad. We can't actually release this stuff. But the rest of us ignored them. So these discussions happen, but maybe in a minority. Like, I feel I wasn't experienced enough to form an opinion, so I just trusted in the leadership and went right through it. After going through that, I would have been more opposing this entire thing. So, uh, I mean, it's a learning experience. You have to go through it first to realize that it was bad. And sometimes you do stuff that are good, but you don't realize until it's out there and people are playing your games. Well, you said that games are resistant to fighting the good fight. I wonder if... Because um, are, are, I've... I don't know. I've had that experience, too. Like, I, I went and actually gave a, a talk in Sweden years ago. Um... Mm. 
uh, through Don't Die, and uh, I mean, I was talking to a graduating class, and uh, you know, um, Uppsala, Uppsala University. Um, yeah. If that, I, I'm, I'm going to guess that means something to you because it's closer to you than it is to me. But you know, I, I gave a talk about how just reminding their game development students, like, you know, you should try to do the stuff that you want to see out in the world. Like, you should absolutely build a strong portfolio and try to get a job, but bear in mind that, like, you should be, you know, seeking to creatively challenge yourself and, you know, contribute the things to the space that you want to see out in there. And yeah. I wonder if, like, I had to, like, I, had to, I, I feel split about that talk because I feel like, in, in some ways, people who are about to graduate college, people who are younger, that's not, like, the best time to try to tell them that. I mean, maybe they will remember it years later, but, you know... It, as you said, that yeah. there will be 300 CVs coming in if somebody leaves. Like, do you, does it feel to you like are games more resistant to that okay, thing I, I you think. just described, where it's like you know you you kind of do have to go you know seven, eight, nine, ten years in the field before you understand like what would have been you know a better approach? Like, do you find that like are are younger people entering the games um, profession are they more stubborn than <laughs> young people in I other think fields? They're better than us old guard like for me uh, I had uh, it's not a typical way into games anymore but since I'm old like I went into games with no experience uh, no degree nothing I just like slipped into it because you start at QA and all you need is like focus and a keen eye and you get the job done nowadays uh, Degrees are required to have these young, well-educated people who have good opinions. And I know for a fact that they don't stay at a place they don't belong. Mm -hmm. um, we've had people leave after their first like game completed because they realized much faster than I did that they didn't want to do that work. Uh, I have the... like. When I mentioned like the degrees and stuff, so I was like, always saw myself as lucky working in the industry and thankful. And so you get, you start not like seeing stuff. Uh, you try to be blind for the bad stuff and you just go do your work. The younger generation are better at seeing what's going on and actually acting on it. Why do you think that is? I mean, you and I are roughly the same age, and I could tell similar stories about my field, but um, why do you think that is in, in games that, that the, the, the young bloods um, <laughs> are less tolerant yeah. of the stuff that you and I thought we had to just do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's partly because they're spoiled, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no, no, but I mean... I think there, we grew up in an age where we found the internet. They've grown up in it. So I think they understand the world better than we do. I, I, like, I have, I'm hopeful for this new generation yeah. that actually takes a stand. I, I didn't. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I, I'm, I have like a 60 year old now, so I'm waiting for him to grow up and see why he takes the decisions he'll take because yeah it's a good question i don't know no no i mean i don't know it's yeah. i think it's the thing you don't usually hear but i think is absolutely right and as i mentioned you know uh this or that panel i've been on or just interacting with you know people who are about to graduate um yeah i think you're right i just uh I don't know why more people don't say that, but I, but I think you're absolutely right. Maybe it's just a matter of like, you know, a couple of really poignant victories or, or uh, things shifting in very obvious ways and more people may come around to saying that. But, um, you know, one thing you mentioned um, a few moments ago is that you don't really like the word product. Um, yeah. I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit about that. It's actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately and not really liking the word consume, and those two words yeah. are usually right next to each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, 
we always say like games are art. They're a culture form of expression and products are not, uh, I feel products are like, yeah, again, like cards, uh, forks, uh, you buy them at a store and then you just throw them away. Games create memories, feelings, they're experiences basically. So when we say product, doesn't feel right. Like, is a movie a product? I mean, Hollywood tries to make it one, but is it? And since we're forming our industry, I think we have the chance to move away from that and just talk about experiences and like making it more. I mean, do you think that that Perception. I mean, something you said is um, in your email. You said you know games don't just happen. And yeah. um, one thing I've really come to hear and understand from a lot of these interviews, and I'm not even necessarily referring to the people who I talk to, but there's just this sort of sense for people who don't work in games um, that. Video games are, like, the way that I talk about it is, like, people feel that, like, video games are, like, a renewable resource that, like, (laughs) like they just come out of the faucet (laughs) in the kitchen. And do you think, like, is there something about the perception of games as, quote-unquote, just a product that is connected with that sort of attitude that, like, oh, they just just happen? Yeah, and uh, I think it's a bit the industry's fault as well. Um, let's say like we have the annual releases and people say it's roughly the same game, there are no new ideas and that's what they interact with most. So the normal gamer uh, or the majority of gamers, they don't see these unique games or the experiences. They see the annual releases and it's easy to see them as a product where you just add a number at the end and go, this is a new thing. And one of the issues that's in the industry's fault as well, uh, we're bad at explaining how games happen. Yeah. Uh, I think think almost by, I mean, I can tell you from a media side, like it it seems almost by design. Um, Yeah. But I don't know what, uh, it's, 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 it seems too aggressive to say marching orders. Like I don't know what the marching orders are like on the company no. side, and I think it has changed a little bit somewhat with social media. But I think by and large, it's still a mystery. It's still meant to be a mystery. Um, yeah. And it, it would it, it, the preference is to keep it a mystery. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it's partly like uh, fear of fa- failure, maybe. Because games are hard. Uh, I've been working like 15 years in games now, and there are multiple projects that just don't happen. They fail and crash and burn because we're not skilled enough to make them. They weren't fun. They weren't whatever. ever. And you have always this fear of promising things, of talking about things, because there's always, there's even like this legal aspect to it let's say working on the Battlefield title, if you say our next game will have, uh, I don't know, like 32 versus 32 player co-op thingy, (laughs) and it doesn't happen because you didn't have the technology. And then maybe you can get sued because someone pre-ordered your game on that promise. So it's a lot of things. Like you don't want to communicate your failures. You don't want to promise things that won't happen. Uh, and it's also maybe a technical question. How do you explain a game engine to someone who isn't in tech? It's not a car engine. Uh, a game engine is just a bunch of code that hopefully works. So I think it's the mix of things. Yeah. Where a, game, a game becomes obscure when we ourselves are not really sure how they work or why. I, I have like this, uh, I work, uh, a game working on right now where the developers were going, 
If you add this comment, the game builds and it works. If we remove the comment, the game doesn't build at all. But we don't know why. <laughs> and like, it's stuff like that. <laughs> How do you explain that? Like when you're working on a Star Wars title and you go, yeah, someone removed a comment, so the patch isn't working anymore. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, I agree. I mean, I think and that's something that like I definitely... I've come to really appreciate on a more deep level, you know, these past few years doing these interviews, like it's kind of, I mean, I always understood that about all like big creative projects. Like it's kind of a miracle that they even come out. And then on top of that, it's a miracle when they're also like good and great. Yeah. Um, but it, it just seems like a miracle to just like orchestrate teams of people of any size to come together and make these things because it's such a complicated yep. thing because it's, uh, you know, games are programming and architecture and uh, there's just so many other disciplines just, just tied up in it. And yeah. I mean, you said um, part of this is like, I'm just going to quote from your email again. You said, you know, this is where yep. we, we as an industry have much to learn. We're either building up the illusion of Superman, like Kojima, Meyer, Balrog, or hiding creators entirely. And yeah. I feel like a lot of this stuff started... I mean, I, 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 my sense of like where this sort of tradition started was like when the industry was much, much smaller and there was bigger yeah. fear of poaching. And I can remember like at the end of those Nintendo games, like you would just see like 80 aliases and things that obviously weren't even names. And then yeah. I feel like this tradition sort of continued because games wanted to fashion themselves after movies and try to play up, you know, the big one big creative voice being like an analog to the director. But yeah. now, decades later, uh, I don't know why it's still like that. And I don't know no. why. I mean, I, I, I don't know why it's like that. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Like, I'd just be curious to hear. I think it's easier. Uh, just the like, in, just the inertia of the tradition. Uh, maybe not even that. Like uh, when you're on the media side, if you can go to Sid Meier and talk about civilization every time, it, it makes it easier for you to get in touch with someone uh, instead of like here's a team of 800 people working on Call of Duty. Who do I talk to? Uh, so there's a bit of that as well, maybe. Uh, and also, like, I think we hide the developers from the yeah. harsh reality because you can be stupid, say something stupid one day, and people will quote you everywhere, and you'll get tons of shit on social media or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you have a trained professional, their answers will be boring, they'll be rehearsed, but at least it will be, like, smooth. Right. The focus will stay where they want the focus to be. Yeah. Um, so what does that, I mean, but like, what does that look like when you go and work at a game company? Because I remember like years and years ago, um, uh, at a place I used to work at, you know, our, our IT guy used to be at Apple. And I had never yeah. noticed until he mentioned, oh, like, you'll never see people at Apple, like, on Twitter tweeting about Apple, like... I think they, I mean, I don't know if this is still true, but I think at the time, like, they have, like, special training on ways to sort of be, like, an invisible internet citizen, you know, to, and I don't know if that's true of, like, game companies, like, is this just sort of, like, a thing that's understood? Do they, do they actually, like, in orientation, do they tell you, like... <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know how other companies do it, uh, that didn't, at least, they just went, don't spoil anything that we haven't publicly talked about. Yeah. So uh, if you go into social media, lots of employees, they they are there and they're talking, but not specifically about unreleased stuff or upcoming stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think it depends on the company. Well, while I was working there, I was happy that there were token people talking to the media. Like I'm a bit of an introvert. So I don't feel comfortable uh, standing in front of the camera talking about a game. Yeah. If there are people willing to do that, I just go, great, go do that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not 
nefarious, but still, uh, for me it was like, uh, it was easy to just let someone else do it because I, I didn't want to. Yeah, yeah. And like I was in a position that I could actually go out and talk about the games. I was a, a producer or a director or anything. And these people mostly have the overarching vision while I was focusing more. My specialty was like DLCs. So I knew everything about those, mm-hmm. but I didn't necessarily know which state the single player was in or which maps were going to be released or whatever. Because it's so big that you need someone and more than a project lead yeah. to know how things are. Yeah. I mean, I'm always curious... And I hopefully I'm not just repeating myself and things I've said or asked elsewhere. I guess it doesn't matter because I'm sure you'll have a different perspective on it. <laughs> um, so that'll be my excuse for maybe <laughs> repeating <laughs> myself. Here. You know, I'm but I'm always fascinated by this dynamic of those, um, you know, the higher up token people, as you call them. Like, uh, like is it is. <laughs> Like, I wonder, like, what they do as far as, like, with their clout. And so I'm wondering, like, is there is there a two-way street here where, because we don't hear about a lot of what's going on at these companies, we don't hear about, like, the great things that these people do for their teams with their status? Because my, my, my sense and what I hear is they just seem to really use clout on promoting current projects and getting leverage on future ones and less so yeah. like personnel. Is that perception accurate? Yeah, maybe. I mean, the project managers and it's a pretty boring job. <laughs> so maybe they don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but are they using because, I mean, their sort of like star status to, to, to help, you know, out on labor stuff? Yeah, maybe they use that. Yeah, that's not it. But I mean, like, I'm pretty sure Kojima is not a rock star in his daily work. He just goes like, does anyone need help? Yeah, what do you need help with this map? What's wrong with it? And he gives recommendations, mm-hmm. more stuff and that, stuff like that. So the day-to-day is a normal person trying to get this massive thing just to fit into something releasable at the end of, a, of the day. Since they have the star power to sell it, that's what you see publicly. Yeah. So, so like they're being created into this role, but at the same time they take it because it helps their game. I mean, you were saying that you know we either build up the illusion or uh, hide creators entirely. So. I mean, like, what do we, what do we lose by not hearing more of those voices in between? I think it's yeah, the, the personality. Uh, it's the small, every game, like let's say artists, they drew, they draw everything you see in the game. Yeah. Like from a grass draw to like a building. And they have this, they have their touches that they're, for a reason. Uh, sometimes they have like Easter eggs with their partner's name somewhere or whatever and you lose that because you only see this is a Kojima game. But no, it's been created by like hundreds of people who have their personal touches in there. So I think that's what you lose, the humanity of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we say product instead of games or experiences or which name right. I think it's a better I mean do, do you feel like um, I mean does the games media or even I guess mainstream media as well like are there ways that games are covered that reinforces these sorts of problems or just that sort of reinforces that kind of thinking I mean look at what you do here uh, you're talking with everyone. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, I'll get that there helps. one day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and you get so many different perspectives. Well, the bigger media, and that's how we've designed the internet economy. They're after clicks. They're after head titles. 
So they don't want to know about this weird dude in Sweden complaining about <laughs> DLCs or loot boxes. They want to know about how Kojima is creating the next fantastically weird experience that he's making. And he has a leather jacket and <laughs> cool music. And yes. Like that smells. And he likes food. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, the media, they're looking for that star quality, which only a few people have. Yeah. I know, I don't. <laughs> you don't yet. Just say yes. You may someday. You never yeah. know. You never know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, my my feeling is like, um, I mean, it, to me, it can, and I feel like this is so fuzzy, and I'm not really referring to any specific site or blog or whatever. I mean, it just yeah. feels like like for many readers and for many outlets, there's this feeling that all that needs to be done is to raise awareness. You know, if we can, you know, like oh, if we if we bring our readers' attention to it, then we've done yeah. our job. But I feel like there are these patterns in discussing, you know, labor problems or other problems in, in the game space where, I mean, like, I just wonder, like, you know, well, what good is raising awareness if it isn't followed by, you know, action? And uh, yeah. it, to me, it just feels like there's not very much accountability, you know? No. And, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, in, in some ways, us focusing on somebody like a Kojima to discuss this, like, only reinforces that dynamic, but... I mean, I guess I understand the reasons why, you know, like why that's the dynamic. I just wonder, like, <laughs> it just seems like these are just interlocked problems, you know, and yeah. I'm not sure because you have one side that isn't really able to talk and you have the other side not really seemingly interested in doing the digging. Um, yeah. And yet at the same time, it doesn't seem like people are aware, like it's the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I work at a small publisher right now, yeah. and we we're also like we're in the like the business of getting the word out, just getting eyes on the next game being released. Yeah, hopefully that will generate sales for the team. That it could be like a couple of people somewhere in the world. Their livelihood depends on this game selling. So then you go this route where you see the media, they're reporting about these specific stories. So you give them these specific stories and they actually write about it. Mm -hmm. It may be a bad loop happening over there as well, where both sides are thinking that this is how things work, but it could be more than that. 